Hello and welcome to The Spectrum Show, a show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to July 1984 to get all the Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games. We try tape to disc conversion the modern way. We play some older games and check out some newer titles. But first, it's back into the time machine in July 1984. The biggest news this month was the fall of Liverpool-based software house Imagine. Already in trouble because of the collapsed Marshall Cavendish deal, the company struggled on, but as the month progressed, things just got worse. In June, one director, Bruce Everest, resigned, and there were fallouts between the remaining three. The company was served with a winding up order by VNU, a magazine publisher, over unpaid fees, and there were also arguments over a separate company, Finchspeed, set up by three of the directors to raise funds. Finchspeed then purchased Imagine's assets, rights to use its premises and copyright of the Mega Games for £40,000. This amount though was not enough to pay off Imagine's debts that were rumoured to be around £400,000. Two thirds of the staff had been laid off and the court gave them just seven days to pay VNU £10,000. Despite a huge sell off of games for just 30p by a German wholesaler, things were looking pretty bad and even bailiffs had been called in several times to the Merseyside headquarters. By the end of the month Imagine were forced to call in the receivers, although this happened earlier than the news stories broke, with the company being wound up on July 9th. News however took time to spread in this pre-internet era. The Mega Games were still a bit of a mystery, and we were told that development would still carry on via Finch Speed. With the QL finally out in the wild, Sinclair are now pushing to get software out. They claim they will have over 50 titles available by the end of the year, rounding up help from other software companies like Scion, Melbourne House, Quicksilver and Ultimate Play the Game. Sinclair have also been in talks with American companies like Digital Research, Lotus and Microsoft. Despite Software House's call for a price drop in microdrive cartridges, Sinclair insists that people will buy software for the QL at the estimated price of £40 per title. Mastertronic have set up a new company to take over the rights and programmers of the recently liquidated Carnell Software. A company called Innovision will sell Wrath of Magra and the Black Crystal at their original price and give programmers Stuart Galloway, Roy Carnell and Stephen Kirk positions in the new company. The company was set up to sell higher price games, keeping the Mastertronic label identifiable with budget titles. Rabbit Software had slipped into liquidation after being in trouble for several months. The company, responsible for such games as Paratroopers and Lancelords, found it difficult to keep going after the recent death of its founder, Alan Savage. A new system is being evaluated that could replace the shelves of games at your local computer shop. The system, called Romox, is already working in America, and UK companies Microdealer and Program Express are looking to install the machines in the UK. The purchaser selects a game from the menu, inserts a blank tape or disc, and the title is then downloaded onto it. This means that all titles will be always available, and will cut down on storage and transport costs. Five machines are set to be installed on a trial basis over the next few months. And now onto the top selling games. Games riding high in the charts this month include Saber Wolf from Ultimate Play the Game, The Maze Romp starring Saber Man, Blade Alley from PSS, a 3D shoot 'em up, Mugsy from Melbourne House, a gangster strategy game with great graphics, Match Point from Scion, the much hyped tennis game. and Lords of Midnight, a massive strategy adventure game from beyond. And that's the news and top selling games from July 1984. For those lucky enough to purchase the Spectrum Plus 3, it would seem the days of slow tape loading were over with Amstrad's decision to replace the cassette deck, as seen in the Plus 2, with a nice 3 inch drive, as seen in the Amstrad range. However, as with any new media format, and like its predecessor the Microdrive, the hardware was only half the story. To make it work, you had to be able to get your existing software collection onto these new fast disks. Because of software piracy, however, tapes had increasingly sophisticated protection schemes on them, making the task of transferring them seemingly impossible. It was hard enough sometimes just to load the tapes. 
Like the microdrive, as the unit became available, a host of transfer options began to open up, the best of course being Multiphase 3, a hardware plugin that allowed users to freeze and save the game to disk. But for those without this unit, the only option, at least in the 80s, was a software transfer utility. There were several of these on the market, but after trying many of them, I had no success. Instead, I had to turn to more modern methods. After trying a few options, I found two to be satisfactory. None are straightforward, and I think that there's a hole in the market to make it all easy. So, let's start. If you want to transfer a 48k game to a disc, you need the following. A Spectrum emulator, a utility called Snap to Tap, a utility called Tap to WAV, something to open and edit WAV files, and a little knowledge of BASIC. There are a few steps to this process, and at first it may seem a little complex, but once you've done three or four, it becomes much more easier, and games begin to stack up on discs in no time at all. First you need to pick your game, in this case, Chucky Egg. Next you need to load the game into the emulator, and at the point where the screen clears, usually after dying or just before the main intro screen, you need to pause the game and save it out as a snapshot file. Once this is done, load up Snap to Tap. Set the option for a blank screen. This reduces the size of the overall finished game and stops the screen from corrupting while loading. Drag your snapshot into this. After a short while it, it will convert this into a compressed single load version of the game. If you can play this tap file and load it into a real spectrum, you can jump ahead. If not, you have to go through an extra two steps. First of all, you need to convert the snap into a WAV file so you can edit it. To do this, use tap to WAV. Open the utility, drag in the file, and instantly you've got a WAV version of the game. Now if this still won't load into a real spectrum, you may have to increase the volume. To do this, load the WAV file into an editor, increase the volume or, or amplify it or whatever the setting is, and then save it out. I found it easier to increase the volume and use the play option from the editing software rather than keep saving out different versions. However, once you can get it loaded into a real Spectrum, we're ready to get it onto disk. First thing you do is reboot the Spectrum and go into Plus 3 Basic. Set the Spectrum to load from tape and merge the loader from the tape file you've just created. Listing the program, you will see a basic loader. You need to make some changes to this. I usually set the colours and clear the screen and print a message saying press any key and add a pause. I do this to allow the drive motor to stop, otherwise the game will run and the drive motor will keep on spinning. So change the loader like the one shown, remembering to change the name of the file you're going to load in. In this case we'll call it Egg2. Once this has been done, set the spectrum to use the disk drive and save this out making it auto run. Once saved we need to go back and edit the code slightly, so that the loader will actually load the code but not run the game. To do this just simply remove the randomised USR line. Set the spectrum to use the tape again, and load the rest of the code in. Because it's compressed, this shouldn't take too long. Once it's loaded, we go back into the listing, and set the spectrum to use the disk drive again. Now this is quite an important step. Using the file that was created by snap to tap you need to load that into an emulator, and open up the tape browser. This will show you the size of the program and the starting address. Using these details, you can now save the code you've just loaded to the disk. Once you've done that, that's the game transferred. So all you need to do is test it. Once you have a few games on disk, you can write a simple menu system that allows you to load the games of choice. And you can even make this auto run. Just write a small basic program that lists the games and offers a key choice for each one. Add a pause detect which key is being pressed, and load the relevant file. If you save this program as disk, making it auto-run, whenever you boot the Spectrum up with the disk in and press enter, it will automatically load this menu for you. As mentioned earlier, it's a pity that snap to tap only works on 48k games, but at least it works. And using this method you can get quite a number of games on a standard disk, because they're compressed. If your Spectrum has a broken disk drive, of course, you'll want to replace it, or even add an additional drive, and the best option to go for is a 3.5 inch version. These can be fitted internally as a direct replacement, with a few modifications that are easily found on the internet, or my preferred method was to fit one as an external drive. 
This is an old drive I found in an old PC I was throwing out, and it was ideal for the job. I searched on eBay, and you can purchase drive kits complete with drives or just the leads and power supply. I opted for the leads and power supply and it turned up very quickly. It's easy to fit. You plug the data cable into the floppy drive and into the disk drive part of the Spectrum, connect the power and you're away. The Spectrum will now treat this disk as drive A, which means you can get rid of 3 inch disks and move over to the easy to get and cheaper 3.5 inch versions. You can use standard double sided double density disks or HD disks as long as you block the hole up at the bottom. They work just like the 3 inch versions, they format to 173K and copying files to and from them is exactly the same. There is an added advantage here of course, in that you can format these disks to a much higher capacity. Using a tool called DU54, which is available on Welder Spectrum, you can get 780K on a single disk. I found this worked great, although the speed of loading and cataloguing was decreased slightly. Once you have a 780k disk, everything works as normal. You can transfer files like we've done before, or you have a much better option. If you've got an old PC lying around with a 3.5 inch drive in, you can use this to directly write DSK files onto these disks, which can be read by the Spectrum. The first thing you need to do is set the PC's BIOS, so that it thinks the internal floppy drive is a 5.25 inch 360k drive. You have to use internal drives however, external USB drives will not work. Once you've set this up you need to download a utility called SamDisk and the associated floppy driver that comes with it. Install these two and you're ready to go. SamDisk is a DOS based tool that can take DSK files from World of Spectrum or ones that you've created yourself and write them directly to the 3.5 inch disk. Once you're ready just pop a disk in, type in the command line and off it goes and in a couple of seconds you've got a Spectrum disc ready to be loaded. From the original tape to 3 inch disc and on to 3.5 inch disc. Of course there are other methods of storing and loading games on the Spectrum and we'll cover those in later episodes. But now I think I need to go and have another game of Road Blasters. Microgen were around from the very early days of the Spectrum, and indeed the ZX81 prior to that. The first batch of games they produced were mainly arcade clones. Cosmic Raiders, released in 1983, was one such game, and despite its flickering graphics and random crashes, it's one of those games I remember fondly. Maybe because it was one of the first games I could actually complete. The game is a cross between Defender and Scramble, seeing you pilot your fighter across a landscape fighting off alien enemies and finally reaching the mothership at the far left of the screen. A map at the top of the screen shows the area you have to traverse like Defender, however you can't fly through the hills. On the way you have to protect people from being abducted and of course shoot anything that moves. The aliens will be familiar to anyone who has played Defender and their actions are very similar. Some pick up humans and take them away and others split off into small aliens and swarm after you. While ever one of the two mothership aliens are present, enemies will continue to spawn, so getting rid of these is your main aim. Once you get to the mothership, you'll find the two aliens, that look strangely like swastikas, and once you've killed these and any remaining aliens, that completes the level. To help you on your mission you have the usual lasers, plus smart bombs, that when detonated destroy anything on screen. The graphics are basic and the sound is adequate. The scrolling could be smoother, but as a quick shoot 'em up, I really enjoy this game. The random crashes are a deterrent though, and the default controls, using 2 and 4 for up and down, 8 for thrust and space for smart bomb, and switch direction using the lower left bottom row of keys is a real pain, but something you get used to. If you've never tried this game and like Defender and Scramble type games, give this one a go, it's not too bad. Rastan, the arcade game, released in 1987 by Tato, was a side-scrolling, sword-wielding smash-em-up, featuring a muscled barbarian type on his way to slay a dragon. 
The large colourful graphics and nearly full screen scrolling made this a challenging port for home machines, but the Spectrum version stands up pretty well. Released in 1988 by Imagine, the Spectrum version sticks pretty much to the original. It has large scrolling landscapes and well animated sprites. Due to the palette limitations however, some backgrounds are tricky to move through and because the sprites are all monochrome, they sometimes get lost in the patterned surroundings, especially in the underground sections. The Spectrum version does not have trapdoors that you have to smash your way through to get to the underground levels. There's just a hole that the player falls through. Most of the game's features and levels have been recreated, including the enemy sprites, collectible items, rope swings, more powerful weapons and level layout. I'm not really a fan of this type of game, but did find myself enjoying this hack and slash session. Difficulty is set about just right, I think. I managed to complete level 1 after about 4 attempts, which was pretty much a similar experience to the arcade game. Level 2 though caused me some problems, especially the rope swings right at the very end, and are much harder than the arcade game to complete. The music has been lifted from the arcade too, playing away as you crush the skulls of more enemies on your way to victory. If you like the arcade game, or in fact like games where you wander around beating people over the head with a sword, then give this one a try, it's pretty good. I know what you're thinking, this isn't a new game, it's Jetpack from 1983. Well, you're wrong. It may look like Jetpack, and it may play like Jetpack, but it isn't Jetpack. This game is Jetpack Advanced, released in 2011. Jetpack is my all-time favourite game across all platforms and spanning all eras, so when I first found out about this game, I thought it was sacrilege to have changed it. After a few glasses of wine though, it became clear that this was almost Jetpack 2, rather than a hacked about original. The first level hasn't changed, but every level thereafter has. The idea came from two Spectrum fans, called Badbeard and Michael Evans, who wanted to extend the original and add some new features. The project was never fully completed though, however, the new levels and a few tweaks did make it out. Because this game cannot be distributed, the only way to get it is to apply a poke file to the original. So, if you have a tape file or a snap file of the original, load it into an emulator that supports the POK file system, drag the file into the emulator and you'll be asked which of the pokes you want to apply. Select the one for Jetpack Advanced and bingo, you've got the new version. Remember to save the game out though, which is now 48k incidentally, to whichever format you prefer, and you're done. The new levels consist of different coloured platforms to the original, in different places and different sizes. The aliens have not changed, this was one of the features that never made it. However, with just the platform changes, this gives the levels a whole different strategy from the original, that, with its fixed platforms throughout the game, tended to have pretty much the same flow, although the varied alien types did provide changes per level. The original to me will always be my favourite game, but this is a good alternative if you get bored of the same level layout, and a damn good game to boot. What more do you need? That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help making the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon.